priestor na diskusiu, na vaše otázky. Vymiežne o hodinu, ak budete dobre, tak možno aj to dlhšie. Keď sa nepravíte, vás musím povedať, že každý, kto sa prihlási, čím skôr, tak mikrofón k nemu pokutuje. Pokud si vás povedzte, v akom jazyku sa si pýtate a využite čas na konkrétnu otázku maximálne na hľadných dve minúty, aby vyšlo na čo najviac záujemcov. Takže kto má záujem, nech sa páči, vyhláste sa. Uvidím, čo to hľadí. Dobre. Good evening, I have one uh, question. Yeah. It will be in English, if possible. Uh, one, one question for you. Yeah, do, so you are considering uh, like a more beneficial way for business is uh, having market to be liberal? Or do you think that some government regulations are necessary? Um, The problem, I think, is not more or less regulations, but regulations that force businesses to compete rather than to create rents. So the difficult part of this is that usually people can come up with some rationale for what really are entry barriers. So my first job, I worked for the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. And we looked at airline deregulation. The airlines in the United States were regulated and there were price floors. And so there was a minimum price that you could charge and this was supposed to protect consumers somehow. So when under the Carter administration, airlines were deregulated and ever since they've had to compete based on price the price of airline flight has fallen by more than 70%. And consumers have benefited from this. So the, I, I think it is, it's wrong to say more or less regulation. I'm a fan of the sort of safety regulation for airlines. What I'm worried about is price regulation or entry barriers. So the, I think there's a, it's a false dichotomy to say more or less regulation. What I'm hoping for is more or less competition. So the, I do favor a, a liberal system, but in the context where government regulation creates a level playing field. So for example, when I worked for the US Federal Trade Commission, we were charged with enforcing the antitrust law. So two companies sign a contract and they agree not to cut their price. That's illegal, that should be illegal. You have to prosecute that. So those sorts of regulations have to be enforced. We tend not to have that kind of regulation and instead we try to find ways to make sure they, that they're not going to cut their price. So it, it's more, it would, it would really be easy if it were just more or less regulation. But unfortunately it's more complicated than that and people are very clever about coming up with a rationale for why things that hurt consumers actually benefit consumers. But it's a, it's a great question because it, it's not a question of, of more or less regulation and that, that is sort of the way that it sounded. Thank you. Uh, you, 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 uh, I you mentioned that uh, the best regulation is competition. Yes. Dobrý, položím otázku v Slovenčine. Legend. Uh, chcel by som sa spýtať takto, akože uh, v podstate to, čo ste hovorili, uh, myslím si, že vychádzalo z toho, že vlastne je nejaký identifikovaný zamestnávateľ alebo uh, majiteľ tej firmy. Uh, čo si myslíte, že by prospelo ako morálnejšiemu správaniu sa akciových spoločností, lebo vychádzam z princípu, že spoločnosť, kde je konkrétny vlastník, sa chová morálnejšie ako teda akciová spoločnosť. Čo by podľa vás prospelo správaniu sa, teda prispelo k morálnemu správaniu sa akciových spoločností?
that's actually a really terrible problem, as I said at the end, and so you, you picked up on it. Um, my system works best if there were a single identified person, the entrepreneur, who's making decisions and can decide uh, what to invest in, what prices to charge. If you have a joint stock company, you have a fiduciary duty. Your contract says that you're trying to maximize the profits for your shareholders. Well, suppose you do the right thing and decide not to engage in rent seeking. You can argue that you're violating the terms of your contract and that the shareholders should fire you. So you would actually need virtuous shareholders. Now, I'm sure there are such a thing, and I know many of you own stock and you're virtuous. But in the US, there are certainly plenty of stockholders that are mostly concerned about maximizing their stock price. So I, I, I think you're right. And I have to say, I had not thought about this until I started working on this problem. Um, even if I could convince you that an entrepreneur can be virtuous, it may be very difficult for a joint stock company to be virtuous unless the government removes all of these rent-seeking competition. So if the best regulation is, is competition, then the state, by removing comp competition, is deregulating in a very harmful way, but it's going to increase the profits of the companies. So what you say is right. I actually think that there's sort of a wedge driven in here. If you're in a company large enough to be a joint stock company, it's going to be very difficult for the manager to persuade the stockholders, look, this would be wrong. It's not illegal, but it's wrong. So please join me in not making me invest in rent seeking. They might very well say, no, nope, you have to do it or else quit. So I think that's a really interesting point. Is that sort of joint stock corporation consistent with virtue if the government is not virtuous, if the state offers opportunities for rent seeking then that can metastasize like a cancer back into the company. There's nothing the company can do about it if the state offers these opportunities for rent seeking. So my question will be in English. That's all right. Professor Mama, thank you for coming. It's really appreciated. It's really good food for thought and everything. I have a question I've been struggling with basically like ever since the start. It's uh, what you're saying, as I understand it, is that rent seeking is any activity which you know, prevents others from doing what you're doing in some way. Either it's you know imports or maybe you know it's preventing others from knowing how you're doing your thing, and that you know that you know diminishes the value because someone else could possibly make it cheaper. You know, so. What I'm struggling with is, with is where do you draw the line? But like, but, but like, when do you start engaging in that? Is it when you patent your first, you know, first uh, innovation? Is it when you stop people from making the same thing by other means? Is it by you know locking your customers in your services, something like that? You know, when, like this is something that you really don't know. Thank you. Well, that's a hard question because it has to do with the definition of rent seeking. And this is a very large literature with a lot of disagreement. Um, but the, the short answer is, rent seeking is harmful when the rent is something that's artificially created. And so you are exactly right. There are some circumstances where even I would say the creation of a new rent or restriction on competition is perfectly justified, like a patent. I come up with a new product and I patent it, and that means only I can produce it. But there has to be some kind of limit on uh, how large an invention be, has to be before you can patent it. So if I come up with something that's genuinely new, you can't immediately just make the same thing because otherwise my incentive to create it is reduced. But in that case, I'm patenting an innovation that's actually of value. Whereas a rent is something that's of no value except for its restriction on competition. So it might be uh, we say that there's only two automobile companies and no one else can make a new one. There's no new product there. No new auto company can come in 
And we didn't make new autos, we just said we're, we're going to restrict ourselves to this. So we see where this is a problem in the United States. Um, software companies, and to a lesser extent hardware companies, have to deal with patent trolls. And so the trolls, of course, are from Norse Norwegian legend. The troll would hide under the bridge, and somebody would try to cross the bridge, and the troll would jump out and say, you have to pay me a tax or I will eat you. Well, patent trolls prevent all sorts of new software. And so what, what they do is that these are not engineers that are writing new software. They're lawyers that are combing through lines of code saying, can we patent this? And one of the things that was patented briefly was the idea of double clicking. So someone patented only five years ago being able to double click on a website. Well, lots of people had double clicked. Nobody had just, no one had patented it before. It wasn't innovation. So I don't know where you draw the line. You're exactly right. But that's the line that we have to argue about. As often happens in the law, that's the key line. But if it creates value, you probably should consider creating a patent or something like that. If it's just double clicking or it's just restricting entry, then no. So I, you know, I can say what the two ends are. I have a hard time saying where the line is. Good evening. You then only one view of your of entrepreneurs and that's to create value. What other features do you think good entrepreneurs should have? Thank you. So the, the question is, um, what other qualities should a good entrepreneur have? And clearly some of the virtues that an entrepreneur would have would be those that go into creating value. So I need to have a certain genius for anticipating what people want, even if they don't know that they want it yet. So most of the really important inventions involve something that didn't exist. So some inventions, like the steam engine, were just the product of the accretion, of the accumulation of physical principles. So a number of people had worked on steam engines before the Scotsman, James Watt, actually came up with a solution to the problem of building a viable steam engine. Now what it took to be viable was that it created a substantial part of the energy that you were burning. So you take coal and you burn it in a steam engine, how much of that energy are you able to convert into motive power? Well, people had been able to get 5-7%, James Watt got it up to about 20%. That, it turns out, was enough to have a patent, that was enough to create value because it became commercially successful. So I think the, the two values that an entrepreneur, virtues that an entrepreneur would have to have is an unwillingness to listen to other people, an unwillingness to listen to other people, because other people are going to say, you can't do that, because no one's ever done it. And the other is a sort of dogged determination, where you continue a long time even though you continue to fail. So if you look at Steve Jobs, the United States now, we celebrate him almost as a god. But they went bankrupt once, and he got kicked out of the company once for being an idiot. Well, actually, not an idiot, an asshat. He was a bad guy. But he had this belief in himself. And it ultimately was vindicated. So I, I think the, the, you need to be right about seeing around corners. You need to have an imagination and you need to have a dogged determination to continue even though everyone is telling you that you're wrong, that that's not really going to work. Now, some entrepreneurship is just arbitrage, where you buy low and sell high, like the, the man gear. What the man gear was doing was going somewhere else to buy and then bringing it here to sell. That's a very useful job, but if, if you're successful at that, you make the profits go away because the prices tend to convert. Whereas for a real entrepreneur, someone who creates a new product or a new value, the profits grow over time because 
you're able to create a brand name. And I guess that's the other thing that I would say that's important, an important character trait, is honesty. So if I can cultivate the virtue of honesty, people are more likely to believe me and willing to exchange with me. They're willing to sign contracts. It's very difficult constantly to be involved in lawsuits, whereas honesty makes people more willing to trade with you. Again, that may be a difficult thing to cultivate. Dobrý podvečer. Uh, takže ako študenta práva ma zaujímala, uh, teraz zaujala uh, skôr časť o, o lobbyzme a o práve, uh, pri všetkom si k výhrade ekonomickej časti, ale chcem sa spýtať uh, túto otázku. Lobbyzmus. Uh, generuje teda lobbyzmus za predpokladu, že tá investícia do neho a do právnikov výrazne prevyšuje tú investíciu do inžinierov, ktorí vidia za rovnako ste povedali. A možno taká podotázočka, že či sa vo svojej práci venujete výhradne lobbyzmu. A ak áno, tak by som si tú štúdiu alebo vašu prácu bol výrad prečítal. Well, that's a fair point. And in fact, in any modern, complicated setting, you're going to need a combination of engineers and lobbyists and lawyers to write contracts. So you can't write co contracts without a lawyer to foresee contingencies. And being able to write contracts is an important part of any entrepreneurial venture that's bigger than two guys working on a computer in their garage. So the, the contrast that I was portraying was a bit too stark. So it, it isn't so much whether you hire lawyers or whether you hire lobbyists, but rather what they're working on. So now we're back to what line is being drawn. Suppose I work for a pharmaceutical company and we create a new drug that has a good chance of curing cancer, but it takes us five years to get the permits to sell it. Well, I have lawyers and lobbyists that work with me to try to get this through the legislature to get them to recognize our property right to produce this very valuable new drug. So in those circumstances, it's because I've already created something that is of value. So under those circumstances, then of course, having lobbyists and lawyers is part of the creation of that value in a modern capitalist society. Suppose instead, and this is happening more and more in the United States, I have an old drug, maybe an antibiotic, and it's had a patent for 10 years. I hire lobbyists and lawyers to find ways, tricky ways, to extend my patent for another 20 years in a way that's not real. I add some an inert, useless chemical to the formula and patent that, and then I can extend my patent. In that case, no new value is actually being created except by the hiring of the lobbyists and lawyers themselves. So your point is a good one. If the lobbyists and lawyers are being hired as a way of securing the value that I've already created, then yes, it's laudable and potentially virtuous. If instead, what I'm trying to do is create a value using the political process, then I'm actually harming people. So the, the, the question is more cause and effect. Um, your criticism is right, I, I said, Hiring lobbyists or lawyers at all is not virtuous, and of course that's not true, so you're right to correct me. Uh, good evening. I will ask a question in English. Uh, I would like to know, you were talking about virtues of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, and one reason why we have this discussion is because the Entrepreneurs have very low reputation among the public and in the politics. Who do you regard to have the main role in changing this process? Should it be or could it be done by politicians, or is it the role for a public to try to pressurize? Or perhaps, and this is mainly probably the biggest part of my question, whether the honest entrepreneurs, the virtuous ones, can and should distinguish themselves from the rent seekers, and if so, how? And uh, whether you see this as a plausible way to move forward? Thank you. Well, that was at least four questions, and they were all very good. Each of them was very good. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of them. 
Um, in the U.S., and this is odd, this is much more true in the U.S. than it is in Europe, the tradition in the U.S. is if an entrepreneur is successful, he creates some kind of foundation and then they give charitable contributions. This for some reason is almost unknown in Europe. So the Ford Foundation or the Gates Foundation. So uh, Bill Gates, the creator of Microsoft, no longer is involved in the making of software, but he works full time in making contributions. And I think most people would say that Bill Gates has changed the world twice. Once by creating Microsoft, which, you know, part of what they did was rent seeking. An awful lot of what Microsoft did was try to ensure by lawsuits and other things that nobody else could license their, anything like their software without paying for, paying for it, even though he basically stole Windows from Apple. So the Windows operating system looks a lot like the old Apple operating system in the sense that you, know, you, you have a mouse, you click on something on the screen. Well, maybe that was rent seeking. But since Bill Gates has used the, the money that he had to make contributions, um, I think it's odd that we tend to think, and you're right, what you said is right, we, we tend to think of entrepreneurs as being bad people unless they become philanthropists. Well, it's as if they're trying to buy back people's favor. The question is how to make people think of entrepreneurs as being good when they're just entrepreneurs, when they're acting as, is the question is, is that possible? Not Bill Gates who then becomes a philanthropist and now people admire him. I think the answer is provide fewer political opportunities for rent seeking, but also we need to celebrate the people who do earn profits as a result of creating value. So we, I, I think the, the mistake that we make is we paint with too broad a brush. Anyone who makes profits must be a kind of vulture or a bloodsucker because profits are evil. That's just not true. Profits can be a sign that you've created a lot of value. That's why I like the story of the itinerant padre. This is someone that created a lot of value through many voluntary exchanges. See, what you need to do is look at where did the profits come from. So, um, I think you're absolutely right. One of the reasons I, I, I work on this question and I like to go out and give talks about it is to create in people's minds at least the possibility that someone who earns profits is also a good person, not in spite of earning profits, but because of it. My name is Richard Turona, I am, I am, and I am with Ines Institute of Economic and Social Studies. Uh, I have a question uh, related to price gauging. Price gauging is a very popular tool in the hands of uh, politicians who, who like it to use to, to limit a, a kind of excessive profits of these, uh, uh, they call it, or immortal profits of, of these virtuous uh, profit seekers and, or entrepreneurs, especially in hard times or in times of crisis, where there is a, a shortage of certain goods or, ser or services. And uh, usually economists argue with the other uh, economic consequences like uh, another or even bigger shortage or a lower quality or less investment, etc., etc. But there is also a strong uh, ethical line behind, behind, this, uh, behind this issue. And you often uh, touch this in your podcast. So, so I would like to ask you to elaborate briefly on this. Well, you know, in a microcosm, that's sort of the whole profits question in one fairly quick little package. And so the reason that I work so much on price gouging is exactly the reason that you raise, that if I can convince people that charging high prices might be consistent with virtue, then I've made progress. And so far, I think I haven't convinced anybody. So let me give it a shot. In the US, and I, I, this may well be true here, I would be interested in hearing, but in the U.S., if there's been a natural disaster, a storm, a flood, an earthquake, then there are laws that say you can't raise the price. Many places, you basically can't raise the price at all. And if you do, it's called price gouging. Now, 
From an Austrian economics perspective, the price is a signal. And the price does two things. One is it signals to other people that this commodity or resource is desperately needed in this location. And the other is it gives outside people the incentive to bring it from where it is to where it's needed. Those two things are really valuable. If you have a law that says you can't raise your price, neither one happens. There's no signal that says we really need it. And no one has any reason to bring it except charity. And so the odd thing is, so this, I, I've written a lot about this actually. In 1996, Hurricane Fran hit my city, Raleigh, North Carolina, the state, the state capital of North Carolina. All of the trees basically in the city were knocked down. The power was out for weeks. And some young men brought ice to the city, ice, frozen water. They brought it to the city and tried to sell it at a high price. And they were arrested because they were selling it for $11 a bag and they bought it for $2 a bag. Now, who is more moral? Somebody who watches on TV and says, oh, that must be terrible, and does nothing. Or the people who get into a truck and take to this desperate city the commodity that they need. We think the people who do nothing are more moral. That seems very paradoxical. It's fine to sit at your house and do nothing. But if you take this product that people need and take it to them, and it's like the man gear, you know, at great risk to myself, I had three shipwrecks. Well, you know, maybe they had a flat tire. They had to drive a long way. They had to use chainsaws to cut their way into the city. It's true they chose a high price. Why was the price so high? It's because people needed it and because the state was arresting people who were trying to sell ice. We actually made it illegal to try to help people. So I think that in a, in a nutshell, in a small package, this problem of high prices is really what people don't understand about markets. And here's how it works. In order to have low prices, you have to allow high prices. In order to have low prices, you have to allow high prices. Because when the price is high, it does two things. It signals to other people that you need it, and it gives them the incentive to do something rather than to do nothing. So it's odd that we think the people who do nothing are more moral than the people who try to help, even though the people who try to help are motivated by profit. Další má závěr, možná byl čas, aby zkladě pána zapáče. Hi, I'm a economist for FFN England, and uh, I would like to ask about the situation with the merit goods. Um, an entrepreneur is uh, producing the merit goods, and when he is isolated in the market or creating barriers to entry, can you give an example of a demerit good? Um, an, an example would be cigarettes, for example. Simple one. And uh, so, instead of this isolation of or creating barriers to entry on a demerit good, then uh, creating a value for the customers and for the entrepreneur because he has high, pro high profits and he can keep the profits, or is this just not creating a value? Thank you. Well, cigarettes in particular really are an interesting example, and the U.S. has had contradictory programs about this for a long time. Um, demerit goods tend to be mature, and they are goods where little innovation is still possible. And they tend not to compete on price, because the government likes the price to be high. And if anything, they charge high taxes, sin taxes, in order to dissuade people from buying it even more. So I think demerit goods are probably not a very good example of, of my definition of entrepreneurship. What they're trying to do is protect their market share. 
And the state is often complicit in this. So again, I live in North Carolina. North Carolina is the biggest tobacco producing state. So in North Carolina, until recently, we had a quota system ensuring that tobacco was by far the most profitable crop that you could grow. By far. Well, except marijuana, which is illegal. I, I keep coming back to that. I, I do not myself smoke marijuana yet. So tobacco was the, the, the most profitable thing that you could grow, and it was because the state was restricting access to who could grow it by having a quota. It was a piece of paper you could buy and sell it in the secondary market. And then we were spending millions of dollars on television ads to try to get people to stop smoking. Well, now there's a new product, e-cigarettes. So there has been innovation. Electronic cigarettes, which are a delivery mechanism for the terrible poison nicotine without tar and the other things that poison your lungs. So the question is, was that an act of entrepreneurship? I think that's an interesting question. So it, it's something that probably is better for people than cigarettes, but are e-cigarettes something that just perpetuates people's use of cigarettes when otherwise they might may die out because it's relatively less harmful. Well, I think demerit goods generally are going to be pretty hard for me to fit my definition of virtue to. Um, partly because they're demerit goods, but also partly because they're, they're mature goods for which additional innovations are not very easy to accomplish. There's a recent paper by an economic sociologist um, Gabriel Rossman, that if you're studying demerit goods, and I'm, I'm happy to send it to you, I, just munger at duke.edu, duke anybody who wants to send me an email, is just munger at duke.edu. Um, but I would be happy to send you a paper, because he, he analyzes demerit goods and even more marginal kinds of markets and asks, under what circumstances do they create value? <coughs> Dám vám po slovenské otázku. Dobrý večer, Prajem. <coughs> Ďakujem konzervatívnemu určitom, že takúto vážnu tému nasadil do predniknutelského prostredia. Totiž to preto, lebo ja tiež publikujem v tomto duchu. Ja publikujem kultúra ekonomiky, ekonomická kultúra troška širšie, hudnejšie a zaradujem tam také veci, ako je morálka, ako je primeranosť, hodnoty pravdivo, spravodlivosť. Ja by som chcel opýtať pána profesora na tú skúsenosť, ako on hodnotí, keď vie ma nejaké akty a porovnáva USA a Európu, keď sa to dá len nejako povedať, kde je kultúra podnikania iná, ako on duchu je podnikateľstvo, lebo ja si podnikateľstvo predstavujem, že musí byť všetko v rámci legislatívy správne, spravodlivo, ošetrené, aj ten zisk musí byť primeraný. Čo nie je primerané, už ide, máme to aj taký prípad na Slovensku, že tu existuje nejaká úžera, sú zvýšené poplatky a tak ďalej, čo je primerané pre vás, pre Ameriku, pre Európu. Ďakujem. Well, there are actually two very good questions that were asked there. One was about the difference between the U.S. and Europe, and conceding that it's unfair to generalize them still, to the extent that you can generalize what is the difference. And the other is, and this is basically Aquinas' question, uh, Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas, in question 77 and 78, asked the question, is it wrong to charge more than a product is worth? And is it wrong to charge usury? So usury is excessive interest. Well, it sort of begs the question, doesn't it? It's already excessive. And I agree it's wrong to charge excessive interest. The question is, how much is excessive? So let me look at the first question. The difference between the US and Europe is shrinking fast. In the US, there was, there was a much more entrepreneurial culture. One of the things that I, I taught in Germany in 2009, and I taught a sort of business and sociology course in uh, Nuremberg, at Friedrich Alexander University of Nuremberg, and I tried to do some analysis of business startups. 
and business startups are almost unknown in Germany compared to the United States. Now, most of the ones in the United States fail. It's not like they're successful. But the, the, if, if you go to a German business school, you're much more likely to work for a company like Siemens or some large corporation and work as a middle or upper management and kind of rise. Whereas in the United States, for a long time, there has been, maybe just because we're bitter, twisted people, we don't want to work for someone else. Everyone in the U.S., after all, if you live in the U.S., you come from someone that didn't like where they were, and so they left. And then the people who really didn't like anything all moved to California. <laughs> so they moved again. Even the U.S. wasn't weird enough for them. They had to go to California. So California has long been an entrepreneurial hotbed. But if you look at the number of startups, it's far less likely that people now coming out of business school try to start something. Now, it, it, is true, it is still true that engineers and other people may try to patent something, but they're not really trying to sell a new product. What they do is they come up with an invention and patent it and then sell it to an existing company, which is something quite different. So I, I think the, what has long been an entrepreneurial culture in the United States, the difference between Europe and the US is shrinking. Now, the, the other question was, what, what limits, what parameters should be legislated about morality in markets? And I'm actually of two minds about this. For prices, I tend to think that trying to legislate about price restricts its price's value as a signal. But there are other considerations, and most countries do have usury limits. In the United States recently, in many cities, we have had a, uh, a rash of companies that open up, and these, these, it's called the payday loan industry. The payday loan industry. So you're, you know you're going to get paid on Friday. So you go on Tuesday, and you say, my paycheck is going to be $250 US and you get a loan until Friday. So they give you $220 US, and so the interest is $30 on $250 for a period of four days, which is a very high interest rate. And the question is, should that be illegal? Well, let's suppose you think it, is, it should be illegal. What does the person who's trying to borrow the money do? What happens? They go to some black market provider who charges at least as high an interest rate, and if they fail to pay, kills them or breaks their legs. The problem is the desperation of the person who wants to engage in these sorts of loans. So much of my work recently has been precisely on the morality of desperation in markets. And I actually found it to be a much harder question than I expected. I went in as an economist, and as most economists, I expected, you know, I, I will analyze this and I will announce the truth to a grateful public. Well, it doesn't work out that way. It turns out that there are, I think, legitimate moral considerations that you have to take, I think, a more nuanced views than many economists take. Still, the problem is, let me put it a different way. Let me, let me give a different example. Many of us would say it's wrong to sell your kidney. So suppose that I'm really desperate and my daughter, I'm very poor, my daughter has a terrible eye infection. If I don't get an antibiotic to cure her eye infection, she's going to go blind. I, there's no way, it costs $3,000. There's no way I can get this $3,000 unless I sell one of my kidneys. We say it's wrong. You shouldn't have to sell your kidney. Well, I think that's, that's right. I shouldn't have to. But then we go on and say, you will not be allowed to sell your kidney. Well, that seems paradoxical. Now my daughter goes blind. And so I go to a black market kidney salesperson, and I'm infected, I end up dying, my daughter doesn't get the medicine anyway. So markets often are the only recourse that desperate people have to save themselves from a desperate situation. The desperate situation was not caused by markets. It might be their only way out. It's the only asset or the only way that they have to get out. Still, 
that desperate situation means that we're not bargaining as equals. And so the normal logic of markets doesn't apply. And so I'm sympathetic. I'm, I, I'm completely dodging your question. But what I want to do is say, I think it's a more difficult question than many economists are willing to admit. There are actually important considerations where many economists simply say, well, all prices should be allowed if they're voluntary. That might be right. But in some cases, these are not really voluntary exchanges. And what then?